Sweet. Let's give everyone a little chance to get in. Okay. Molusca. Molusca. Up Hazel. Mm-hmm. Hazel's in. All right, everyone, good morning, and welcome to another Thursday morning Facebook Live here at Project Oceanology. Again, my name is Kyle. I'm going to be uh, the educator talking to you a little bit about mollusks today. Now, summertime is finally rolling in, and that means we're starting to see a lot of the animals that like to migrate or come close to shore in Long Island Sound when the water warms up. Okay, so some of them include some of my favorite animals in Long Island Sound, which happen to be uh, members of this phylum, the mollusca, and they are the cephalopods or the squid. So today we're going to be doing something that uh, some people might be a little bit squeamish about. It's going to get a little messy, uh, but we're actually going to be doing an uh, investigation on the biology of mollusks and specifically uh, inshore squid today. Uh, so that includes a dissection, uh, but I want you all to not worry about this. The, squid that we have today were harvested sustainably and we got them from a uh, seafood shop and all the remains of the squid today are actually going to be being fed to the live specimens that we have here in the lab. So I wanted to begin a little bit about uh, talking about what mollusks are and uh, how squid kind of relate into that phylum. So uh, there are all kinds of different mollusks. Uh, we have a hypothetical ancestor here uh, from which all the other kinds of mollusks have evolved. Uh, and they have a lot of things in common. Uh, some uh, cousins of each other have certain differences based on their shell type and whatnot, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but basically, a mollusk is, uh, it, some of you may have heard of them already in the form of clams or snails. Uh, chitons are kind of snail-like animals that cling to rocks at the beach. You may have seen those. And then, of course, the cephalopods, the octopuses and the squids and things. Uh, so all of them uh, have what is known as a, uh, a mantle, uh, which is uh, in different animals, it takes different shapes. Uh, but the mantle for the squid we'll talk about is this big uh, part here where a lot of water flows in, and that's where all their organs are as well. So on the cephalopods, it just looks like a big head, uh, but we'll investigate that a little bit further. All right. Uh, they also have an open circulatory system for the uh, hypothetical ancestor. And you notice uh, a lot of them will have what's called a radula. So lots of different things that are seen throughout all mollusks, but sometimes they evolve to be a little bit more unique. So as always, if you have any questions about what we're looking at today, feel free to post them in the comments and we'll uh, get back to you. Also, shout out where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear where everyone's watching from this morning. So since we only have a little bit of time today, I'm gonna to move on from this and actually go look at the specimen that we have for you today, okay? So come on this way while we talk about it. We've got Rosaria from Waterford High School. All right, hello Rosaria, thanks for tuning in today. Now, this is one of my favorite activities to do uh, just because I like talking a lot about squid. Uh, even though they are some of my favorite animals, I feel okay dissecting them uh, just because they're not going to be going to waste. All of our animals are going to be being fed today and they love to eat squid. So squid are very uh, economically and also uh, ecologically important species, especially in Long Island Sound here. So lots of different kinds of animals rely on them as a food source uh, and their population is very strong around here too. Uh, so, a little bit about the squid that we have here today. Uh, we have a longfin inshore squid. Uh, there are two species that we have around in Long Island Sound, the shortfin and the longfin. Uh, this one is the closest that we could find to the ones that we have around here, but it's actually the Pacific cousin of the longfin inshore squid. So, it's actually a Pacific species of inshore squid, but they look 
uh, a lot alike and they have a lot of similarities because they belong to the same genus. Uh, so we'll be using this as our specimen to uh, relate to the local species that we have around here. Uh, it may look a little goopy right now, it is just defrosted, uh, but I'm going to start out by talking about the external anatomy of the squid, and then we'll go ahead and get into the dissection later. Uh, so, and so you don't have to uh, keep looking at the squishy squid on there, I can also use the stuffed animal uh, so I can manipulate it without getting my hands all sticky and messy and whatnot first. Uh, so a little bit about the external anatomy. Some of us are already pretty familiar with how they're shaped, uh, but it's kind of a mystery to some people about how they move around and how they actually live. You know, most people, when they think of squid, they only really see them in restaurants in the form of calamari, right? Some of people like to eat squid, but don't really know much about them. Uh, so I like to start out talking about how they move around, uh, basically how they go through life, and a little bit about their natural history. Uh, so our squid, uh, you notice, has some very apparent features. Uh, the first one we already talked about is the mantle, which is like this long part that looks like the head. Uh, and it's actually more than just the head. This is most of the squid's body is here. Uh, all the organs are in there, and uh, we'll get a chance to look at those in a little bit. Um, now, I have a couple questions for you folks in the audience, and let's see if you can uh, answer these. Uh, they're a little bit tricky, uh, but the first question is, how many tentacles does a squid have? All right. And then uh, I also want to know if any of you know how they move around and also where the mouth is. Because if you're looking at this animal, it doesn't have a smiley face right here or anything. Uh, you can see that a lot in cartoons where they just have the big eyes and like a smiley face around the front. But there's no smiley face on this squid here, nor on this uh, more anatomically correct stuffed animal. Uh, so I want you all to take a guess as to where the mouth is. How do you think it moves around? All right, and uh, go ahead and put those in the comments. They take a little bit of time to show up, so we'll get to those afterwards. But while I'm waiting for you to take some guesses at those questions, I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy here. So we have the overall shape of the squid laid out here, but I do want to show you and point out some of the most fascinating anatomical features on the outside of the squid. And there's all these little spots here. They look kind of like freckles all over the squid. And these are really important for the squid uh, in order for survival and also communication. So these are called chromatophores. And these are basically specialized uh, features in the skin that can open and close or kind of expand to uh, allow more pigment to be shown in their skin. So they can kind of uh, blow up sort of like a balloon and show more pigment or contract and kind of hide all that color. So squid can actually change colors and very quickly. Uh, they don't even have to really think about it. They can do it uh, immediately to sort of blend into their surroundings, uh, but they can also use it as a form of communication. So I wanted to show you a picture here. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it with the glare, but you can see how the squid swim together in large groups. And that's how we usually catch them too, is many at a time, they're not typically alone. They all swim together in big groups. They all reproduce together in big groups. And then unfortunately, they die right after they reproduce in big groups like this. Uh, so this is actually a photo of squids reproducing. And you can see that there are a couple squid here that have really bright red tentacles or arms. All right. Now that is a signal to other ones that they should stay away because these two are already mating, uh, so they don't want to fight or anything like that over the same female. Hmm. So the males will actually express their color uh, through those chromatophores to be a brilliant bright red and look kind of scary. So usually when squid are mad or they're trying to look frightening, they turn bright red. And then they can also go to like this kind of clear white color. Now that's really good if they're trying to hide because it's kind of tricky to pick them up. If they're bright red, they show up more, but if they're sort of pale, it's easier for them to hide uh, in the water. They look a little bit more see-through. So that's a strategy for them to uh, kind of hide in the open water. Uh, it's harder for them to see if they're see-through. Uh, but then also if they're over a white substrate like this, like this kind of whitish sand, they're going to be lighter in color. If they're over like a dark mud uh, substrate like we have here in Long Island Sound, they're often a little bit darker. So they can match their surroundings. Uh, to their skin color so they can hide really well because they don't want to be detected by any would-be predators because like I said, lots of things like to eat these animals at all different stages of their life. 
uh, going from their eggs all the way to the larger adults, which can be about 50 centimeters. Uh, now, these squid, um, they only live for usually a year or less. So their entire life cycle happens in that year. So they start out swimming in these big groups. They all reproduce en masse. And now all these little capsules here uh, didn't come from a single female. The entire group of them swims down and will stick these sacs uh, to rocks or algae or to other egg sacs. Uh, each female producing about 10 to 13 of these uh, squishy things. Here, I actually have a better picture here. Right there. And uh, each one of these capsules can contain about 200 little eggs. So each one of these capsules is going to be uh, up to a couple hundred squid itself. So one squid, depending on her size, can produce thousands of eggs to replace herself in the population. But she doesn't really provide any parental care to those babies. She just goes down, lays the eggs, and then she unfortunately dies soon after. They use up a lot of energy in their reproduction, and they have a very short life cycle. So they go from hatching uh, from these eggs, then they're about the size of a grain of rice. This is a zoomed up picture of a uh, squid, but you can see all those little chromatophores already developing. While they're in the egg, they can actually change colors. Once they hatch, uh, they look like little squid. They're about the size of a grain of rice, but they're already voracious predators. So they'll be uh, planktonic at this stage. Actually, uh, we'll catch them in our plankton sample sometimes, and they're feeding on smaller zooplankton, or sometimes even prey that are four times their size. So mice, shrimp, and other crustaceans, uh, larval crabs, they feed on those uh, voraciously and then they grow very quickly. So they go from the size of a grain of rice all the way to like 50 centimeters in just a few months. So then they'll reach adulthood, they'll all reproduce, swim down, lay these eggs, and then that's their strategy for reproduction is just make as many babies as they can uh, and then they won't be able to pr provide any parental care for them. So these chromatophores are really important for that. Uh, they can communicate with each other and uh, signal to each other while staying in these groups, and also they can avoid predation. So these little spots are really important for them. We've got a couple guesses about how many tentacles it oh, yeah? has. Yeah, we've got two people who said that they have two, but I'm looking at this squid and there seems to be more than two things coming off of it. Uh -huh. So, what's, what's <laughs> so it seems a lot of you have avoided my trick question. Yeah, usually I'll say how many tentacles does it have and people will say eight uh, because people are used to saying that when it comes to like octopus and things like that. And uh, that's pretty close, but two tentacles is actually the right answer. So like octopus, their cousins, these guys here, uh, squid do have eight arms, but then they also have two tentacles in addition to it. Octopus don't have the tentacles. Uh, the difference in definition is that the tentacles can kind of extend or retract. So typically they're kind of held up in the body with the arms. Uh, but then when they want to find prey or they're trying to catch something, they'll sneak up on their food, shoot those tentacles out, grab hold of it, and pull it into their arms, uh, which have suction cups all the way down the length of the arm. The tentacles will only have suction cups on the very end, on the very pad of it. So let's see, I can show you on the, the real squid here. These shorter appendages here with suction cups going all the way up the length, those are their arms and these skinnier, longer ones are the tentacles. So you can see how much longer they are. But normally these are uh, held up into the body like that unless they're being shot out to catch prey. And then somebody else said that the mouth of it is somewhere in between all of those legs and tentacles. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, they shoot those tentacles out, grab hold of their food, and bring it back up into their arms so they can hold on to it and take little raspy bites out of it because their mouth is right in between those arms. So mm -hmm. I'll push this back so you can see there's a little black speck there that's surrounded by muscle. We'll get a better look at it in a bit. Uh, but this is actually their mouth. It looks, it's called the radula, and it looks like a little bird's beak. So I'll show you that in a little bit once we start the dissection. All right, but good answers so far. Now, did anyone answer how they move around? Um, someone mentioned that they might use their fins to move around. Okay, yeah, so 
we do have these little fins up at the top of the mantle and they are used for movement. However, it's not their main source of locomotion. These are mostly just for steering uh, and kind of turning around. Uh, they can sort of move a little bit with them, but if they really want to get going, they use jet propulsion, okay? So normally this entire mantle is filled with water. Like I said, all the organs are in there, so they need their gills in there to, in order to breathe. Uh, and, they, and it's basically just a big muscle that can kind of expand and contract. So when it expands, it fills with water, and when it contracts, it forces that water out through an opening. Now that opening, I'm just gonna turn the squid over, is right here. So it's called the siphon. And basically it's a small opening through which a large volume of water is going to be pushed through just like a jet ski. So you uh, force a large volume of water through a small opening and that creates thrust. So they can zoom around really quickly. Uh, so I'll show you on this. So basically they fill this all with water, they squeeze this mantle, force it all through the siphon and they can sort of jet through the water like that. All right, so let's see here. So we have the arms, we have the tentacles, we have the mantle, the fins, and the siphon. All right, and, okay, so let's see here. Now let's get into the inside. Uh, so I wanna show you all the organs and everything. So I'm gonna make one incision up from the siphon and hopefully not cut any of the delicate organs that are in the way. All right. So this is the fun part where it gets nice and goopy. All right. So we have a pretty good specimen here. Uh, luckily, nothing is uh, all that broken. Let's see. I'm gonna do like an aerial shot maybe so we can get a better look. All right, very nice. So moving up from the siphon, you can see that there are a lot of things uh, that actually move into the siphon. And there's a little duct here with a black speck above it right here. So let's see if anybody can guess what that is uh, while we move on to it. Now I'm gonna show, tell you how to uh, tell if your squid is a boy or a girl and uh, one way you can tell is by looking up at the top organ right here. This is their gonad. So this is where they store their reproductive cells. And in here you can see lots of tiny little, uh, they look like glass beads, but these are actually young eggs. So I know that this one was a female. So these are all undeveloped eggs right here. It looks kind of like clear caviar. So that's how I can tell that it's a girl. Also, for some reason, uh, the females have red kidneys. So you can see uh, in here, there's like a red spot. And those are the kidneys. So that's one way to tell. If this was a male, uh, this would be kind of a, uh, a white color, sort of like this right here. So it'd be white, and typically the males can get a lot bigger too. They grow faster and get bigger than the females because females have to invest a lot of energy into producing those eggs. All right, any guesses on what that black thing is? Not any yet. Not any yet? All right, well, we are, uh, we do have a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna let you all know. This is actually their ink sac. So just like octopuses, uh, squids uh, have ink as a defensive strategy, so they can mix this ink with a little bit of the water that they hold in their mantle and squirt it out through their siphon if they're feeling threatened. All right, yeah, it looks like a couple people are guessing yeah, ink sac here, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a little bit of lag here with the comments, so uh, bear with me. Uh, so yeah, this is the ink sac, and they use that for defense. Now, the ink isn't poisonous or anything like that. Uh, it's basically just pigment that they get from their digestive system. Uh, they take pigments from animals they eat and store it in the ink sac, so they can refill it if they run out of ink, uh, but it does take a while. Uh, but it's all natural, it won't hurt anything, but they do also mix it with some mucus when they squirt it out uh, so that it can get a little sticky and that might cling to a would-be predator's eyes or gills and make it a little bit of a uh, uh, deterrent when they're looking to eat this squid. All right, so I did want to show you these here because we talked about how they breathe. Now these little feathery bits on the side 
these are actually their gills. So like I said, this, uh, this body is usually full of water and uh, that is where the gas exchange happens. So just like people have to breathe oxygen through the air, the squid have to breathe oxygen through the water. They're just getting it through a different fluid. So these work uh, essentially the same way that our lungs do. Uh, However, there is a little bit of a difference here. So uh, once the oxygen gets into those gills, then they need to spread it all over their body. And the way we pass oxygen through our body is with blood. So if we look kind of at the base of each of these gills, you might be able to see like a fleshy orb at the base of them. So each one of these gills actually has a heart. So they have a heart for each gill, and then they also have a central larger vena cava. So more hearts than people have, uh, but they are smaller. All right, so I did want to show you the mouth. Now this part might be a little oogie for some people, uh, but the mouth is surrounded by a large muscle because they have a pretty powerful bite for their size. So I'm actually just going to squeeze out that muscle and get a better look at this mouth here. Now, attached to it is the esophagus. That'll pop right off the stomach, and we can show you the mouth itself. So, once I take these out of their muscular casing, you can see that there are just two thin little plasticky looking bits. When they come together, it forms sort of a bird's beak. But they're sticky, so it's kind of hard for me to do that to show you. Uh, so they form a bird's beak and take little raspy bites like that. Now some mollusks will only have like one half of these, so it's just like a single uh, beak to scrape algae off of rocks. Uh, but these squid have evolved to have two that come together like a beak, so they can take more powerful bites out of their food. So. There are only a few parts of the squid that are actually kind of hard. You notice they have no bones. Uh, this, the uh, radula, is part of uh, their body that is hard, and it's made out of chitin, which is a carbon compound. That's kind of, uh, yeah, the esophagus and stuff is sticking to me. Uh, so it's kind of like carbon fiber, you can think of it. It's like pretty sturdy, but also lightweight and flexible. Lots of people have like carbon fiber, like hockey sticks or uh, fancy road bikes because they're lightweight, but they can go really fast on them and they're sturdy. Marissa had a question. She wants to know how, what do they eat if their mouth is so small? <laughs> so like I said before, they can actually take on prey that are like four times their size. Uh, they just hold on to it and take little raspy bites out of it until they can eat the whole thing. So if we looked at its stomach, we wouldn't be able to see like a whole fish in there. Uh, it would just look like mush, but they can, they'll pretty much eat whatever they can get a hold of. Uh, so from the time they're planktonic, they're eating small little mycid shrimp and amphipods and things like that. And by the time they get to this size, they're taking on uh, smaller crabs, sometimes smaller squid, and small fish usually. But uh, they're really effective predators. Uh, so basically anything they can catch and hold on to, they're going to be eating that. But they are meat eaters. So that's a good question. Even though their mouth is so small, they can still eat a uh, much bigger prey because they don't have to swallow it whole. They just take little bites out of it. Now what's this big feature right there in the center? Big feature in the center right here? Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, one of my favorite features to talk about, and those are the eyes. So uh, looking at this animal, even though its body is pretty big, the eyes are still pretty big as well, right? Now does anyone know why squid have to have such big eyes? Uh, think about where they might live in the water. Uh, and they are visual predators, so they do have to find their food. And I'll give you a minute to talk about that. Uh, but if we want to uh, carry on and talk about how this squid is related to other mollusks, uh, I have a few specimens from other mollusks here that we can talk about. Uh, now, all the mollusks that we talked about, the clams, the snails, uh, the squid, they all pretty much have some things in common, right? They have a pretty squishy body. Clams and snails underneath the hard shell is pretty squishy and soft, right? They have no bones, so they're soft-bodied. Uh, they have a shell, so the shell is made out of calcium carbonate. Uh, now, we don't really see a shell on the squid here, right? 
So how can we relate that to these other mollusks well, just by looking at it? It's a little bit tricky, but uh, actually these squid do have a shell. It's just a little bit more uh, evolved, a little bit more derived. So it's specific for what these squid like to do. Think they need to swim around in the open water in large groups, being relatively mobile and quick to catch their food. Uh, now, if they had one of these big heavy shells for protection like clams or snails have, that would be pretty hard to dart around the water really quickly, right? Uh, so they've actually evolved to have their shell more internalized and lightweight. So in order to show that to you, I'm actually gonna take all these organs in the body and everything. I'm gonna pin down the mantle here and I'm just going to get these out of the way. Ooh. We can go back to those later. Now that all that's left over are the gills and the mantle itself and inside the mantle, so we can do this gently without breaking it, kind of thinly attached to it is their shell. So this is a modified shell made out of chitin. It just feels like flimsy plastic, uh, but it's uh, relatively sturdy and it helps the squid keep its shape. Uh, so as you can see, it breaks pretty easily. So it's still really thin, but it does uh, keep a little bit of structure there, but it's not as heavy nearly as the snail or the clam shell because this has a little bit more calcium attached to it, just like our bones. So they're more dense and heavier. So more protection, a little bit heavier. Uh, this one is mostly just for keeping it straight because you can picture uh, if the squid was trying to swim around without that keeping it straight, it would be kind of floppy, right? <laughs> Not so good for swimming around. What's that part called? So this is called the gladius or the pen. People call it the pen because it looks kind of like an old timey feather quill that people used to write with. It's sort of feather shaped. And uh, you can actually use this as a pen using capillary action in the ink from the squid. So it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of ink left in here, but let's see if I can pop that ink sac open and mix it with a little bit of water. And we might actually be able to write with this. Let's see. So you can, it draws up a little bit and there's not a whole lot of ink in here, but. He was a peaceful squid. Yeah, or it inked right before it was frozen. So it ran out, unfortunately, but that's all right. Yeah, doesn't look like there's a whole lot left in there, unfortunately. But people did actually use, use these for writing sometimes. Uh, if mariners ran out of ink at sea they can, and they caught some squid, they can use this squid ink for it too. So it can still be used as ink. Some people even use it as a coloring to color food like pasta or burgers in Japan. All right, so I wanna go back to the eyes real quick before we wrap up. Did anyone have any guesses as to why they have such big eyes? Someone said the better to see you with. Well, yeah, pretty much. Uh, but if we think about where these squid like to live, notice they're all the way down at the bottom on that picture, right? And that's usually where we find them. Deeper down, away from the surface, uh, they like to kind of cruise around the bottom looking for food. And down at the bottom, there's less light. So they need bigger eyes to absorb more of that sunlight in order for them to find their food. Yeah, and you can see in this picture too how big their eyes are. Yeah, absolutely. Squid actually have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. Not this species specifically, but their cousins, the giant squid or the colossal squid. Scientists aren't really sure whose eyes are bigger, uh, but those eyes are about the size of dinner plates. Wow. Yeah, so you compare that to the largest animal, the uh, blue whale, their eyes are even smaller than that, even though they're much larger. So they need to have these really big eyes in order to find their food. And their eyes are actually uh, really cool features because they've evolved in a different way than vertebrate eyes. So our eyes evolve differently than the squid eyes have. So they have these really large eyes for absorbing lots of light. And also they're more efficient than our eyes because it wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to actually show you on the squid itself because it would be a little too mushy, but their optic nerves actually attach up and over the retina, which is the part of the eye that absorbs uh, the sunlight and uh, gives us the signal to the brain to actually make the image. Uh, it goes up and over the retina and attaches in front of that retina. Now vertebrate eyes, 
they actually, the optic nerve attaches behind the retina. So we have sort of a blind spot in our eyes that our brain has to correct for. Now, the, uh, the squid have evolved to bypass their retina completely, so the optic nerve doesn't have to pass through, and it's much more efficient, so they don't even have that little blind spot. So their eyes are very big and very good at be and very efficient at seeing. Much different than the vertebrate eyes. So if anybody else has any questions about the squid, uh, feel free to post those in the comments and we'll get back to them. But I hope you understand uh, just how complex these animals are. And it's important for us to do these dissections to understand how the animals work. And it can also give us a better idea of uh, how our bodies work as well in relation to our other animal cousins. Uh, and again, don't feel bad about the remains of this, fit of this squid. They're gonna be fed to our large fluke that we have in the seawater lab. Uh, so this will be a very happy fish's lunch today. <laughs> so tune in again on Tuesday for another Facebook Live and uh, let us know if you have any questions. We'll answer them in the comments. All right, take care. Thanks guys.